Well, we invite you to open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. <clears throat> Hebrews in chapter 3. I don't know if you've ever seen some of the weird signs that have been displayed on various tools. If uh, you've ever owned different tools, uh, people do weird things with their tools. So there has to be warnings put on those tools so that you won't do dumb things with those tools. I, uh, I have a nail gun at the house. And on the side of the nail gun, it has a little picture of a guy climbing a ladder. And apparently he must have the trigger pulled. And then it shows a picture of a guy underneath him climbing the ladder too, and the guy's nail gun hitting the top of the other guy's head and shooting a nail into his head. And the, the moral of that story is someone did that and sued and won some kind of money, right? And so they said, don't climb the ladder with your nail gun in hand and someone below you climbing the same ladder because this might be the end result. And if you do it, you can't sue us now because we just warned you. And we also see those little, you can see those little packets that go into some of your um, mm -hmm. groceries, mm -hmm. and it's to keep your uh, food from getting moisture, right? You ever read those things? Do not, Do not eat. Yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> Apparently someone ate that at one point in time, and we've been warned. Don't eat that. It's not good for your health. And, and I've seen so many strange warning signs over the course of my years. I'm certain you have too. We could go around the room and tell all the crazy ones. I'm certain they're going through your head right now, especially some of you mechanics and different people that own different tools. You've seen some crazy stuff. Well, we have warning signs all over the Bible, don't we? They're there. The Bible warns us about all kinds of things, and they're meant from God to deter man from the inevitable wrath, if you will, of what God is going to do if man continues in their sin. The warning here that we have that we're going to see here in uh, Hebrews in chapter 3 um, is that we need to hear the gospel message and make the correct decision about it. In the Old Testament, it tells us that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Sometimes we get the idea that God is sitting there up in glory and he sees someone like Adolf Hitler and he just can't wait to squash Adolf Hitler and send him to hell forever. And sometimes we hear people say, I can't wait for you to die and go to hell. Right? You've heard people say that. What a horrible thing to say. That is not God's attitude, by the way. God created each and every one of us in his image. Exactly what Genesis tells us. It means that we all have a soul. God loves each and every one of you. No matter what you've done in your life, no matter what's going on in your life, God loves you. God cares about you. The Bible tells us that God knows everything about you. Right? He knows, and you've heard me say this before, how many hairs are on your head, doesn't he? For some of us, that's getting pretty easy to count. <laughs> but he still knows it. He knew you before you were born. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants you to talk to him. He wants to talk to you. By the way, how does God talk to you? Through the word of God, doesn't it? Those are his words to you today. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, God speaks to us. Now, I don't think you hear an audible voice. I've never heard an audible voice. I've never had a 14-foot angel present himself to me like Oral Roberts did. <laughs> he never told me to raise a million dollars or I'm going to die. But if you listen, you can hear God's still voice, can't you? Read through the scripture. Know what God is saying to you. Understand what God is saying to you. God loves you. God cares for you. And then in the New Testament tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I think that's in 1 Peter. Here, when we get to, actually, I think that's 1 Timothy that um, uh, none should perish, but whatever. Here, in Hebrews, in chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, we have another 
of God's warnings, and it's to unredeemed men. Those that do not know the Lord as their personal Savior. And really what he's going to say here is turn to Christ before it's too late. I think that it's speaking to many people who sit in pews every Sunday. They go to church, but they never become believers. They know the gospel. They know the truth. And I'll tell you, in America, people know what God did. People know what John 3.16 says. People can go to church freely here. And I would venture to say that most people in America, probably 90%, know that Jesus died on the cross. They might not know why, but they know something. They've heard parts of the truth. They, they may have even gone off and seen movies, The Passion of the Christ. They might watch TV shows that depict it. And I'll tell you today, God is saying, turn to Christ. Why do people reject? That's an interesting question, right? Why would someone reject? If God has provided his son to pay the price for your sins so that you can go to heaven, why would people reject that? To the believer, that sounds crazy that anybody would reject, doesn't it? But why do they do it? Well, I can tell you from personal experience, from speaking with people, from witnessing to people, usually... It has to do with, I have things that I want to do with my life, and I know that if I become a Christian, God says it's a sin, so I don't want to become a Christian because I want to do these things. They love their sin more than they love God. And the reality is, if they become a believer, then God changes our desires, God changes the things that we think we want to do, because the reality is, if they keep heading down that line and, and filling themselves with their sins, there is so much pain that comes with that. If you've lived a, a rough lifestyle and you've been involved with sins in your past, boy, you know what the end results of those are, don't you? And I've seen it time after time after time, and the great heartache that comes with it. This group of people, a lot of them are apostate. And what does apostate mean? It means they know the truth, but they're rejecting. And so I'll tell you, I believe there's many that are apostate throughout our world today. So we get this warning. And this warning comes to the people that this book of Hebrews is written to, which is Jews. And the Jew, in order to get much across to them, because they were... I know re recently we've been hearing the word numbskull again. They were numbskulls, and, and they had very thick skulls. If you couldn't prove it to them with the Old Testament, they were not going to listen to one thing that you have to say. Holy Spirit knows this, doesn't he? We don't know exactly who penned these words, who the Holy Spirit used, but the Holy Spirit wrote it. And so he's going to go back to the Old Testament and give them the words that they need to hear. We have been talking about Moses here in chapter 3. Maybe your chapter heading says that Christ is superior to Moses. We talked about that last week, saw how Christ is greater than the person that they all look to. And so since Moses is already the subject, then he chooses an illustration from Moses' life to tell us today and to tell the Jews then, you need to turn to Christ now. Don't wait. So we get four parts. They're not particularly profound as we consider these things, but there are four points here. We're going to see an illustration. We're going to see an invitation. We're going to see instructions. And then we're going to see what the issue is. So the illustration that the Holy Spirit chooses to begin with, uh, quoting from the Old Testament, he's actually going to quote David, because David is quoting about the time of Moses. So you say, well, how, why are we going to quote David when you just said we're going to talk about Moses? Well, David, in Psalm 95, is, is referring back to Moses. So the Holy Spirit quotes David, but it's really David quoting what's happening before him. If you can follow that, okay. 
And it's referring then to Israel in the wilderness. What went on in the wilderness? It's a classic example for uh, the Holy Spirit to make here. And it's quoting from Psalm 95. Israel, if you'll recall, spent quite some time in the land of Egypt. It wasn't a great time for the land for the Israelites. They had sinned, and every time they sinned, God puts oppression upon them. So here they are, 400 years underneath uh, Egypt's rule. And as time goes on, Israel is wanting to get out from underneath their rule. Of course, makes perfect sense. They are being used as slaves. And they're slave labor, they're not making any money, they're treated horribly, and they're making bricks. And by this, and by the time that the Israelites um, are finishing up their time in Egypt, they're literally making bricks without straw. Now, back in the day, uh, when they were making bricks back then, straw was that agent that kind of held all the bricks together. I mean, it made it way easier to make bricks. But now they, the, the word has come down, you can't even use straw anymore. You just need to mix up mud and make bricks, and they better work, or we're going to punish you. They better be good, or else. So they were oppressed. They were beaten. And God has finally heard the Israelites and heard their, their prayers, and the Israelites are seemingly wanting to turn back to God, and it's time for God to get them out of Egypt. So you know what happened, right? You got all the plagues. We, we talk about the plagues. We have trivia in Sunday, Sunday school, and once in a while we get, what was the third plague? I think Libby has her Bible marked to where the plagues are so she can turn there real quick and figure out what the third <laughs> plague was real fast. Well, then the last plague was a tremendous miracle, wasn't it? It was tremendous for the Israelites, Horrible for the Egyptians that were unwilling to listen to God. And we took communion today. This is, an illustration is given there that, that points towards communion, doesn't it? They were to slaughter a lamb, put the blood on the doorposts, and that night the death angel went out. If you had blood on your doorposts, your family was fine. If you had no blood on your doorposts, your firstborn is dead. Woke up the next morning to thousands of dead children. What a horrible plague. No fun for those people. They finally relinquish and say, fine guys, you just get out of here. Because remember, when the plagues would come, God, the, the, they would say, oh, we can't take these flies anymore. Just leave, right? <laughs> Get out of here. And then once they'd start leaving and God would have the flies go away, then they're like, oh, no more flies. You guys need to keep your slave labor. Well, this finally did it for them. They leave. And as they start going, then what happens? They start regretting their decision, don't they? So they start chasing the, the Israelites. And during the day, they had a cloud that they would follow. And at night, there was a pillar of fire that they would follow. And then they hit the Red Sea, and you got a problem. You can't get across, and the Egyptians are behind you. So what happened? God split the water. They walked through on dry ground. Egyptians go in. And God breaks the wall that he had provided for them, and they drown. Tremendous victory, right? What, what an amazing miracle. What a tremendous thing to happen. And let me tell you, if you were there seeing that, can you imagine that? Walking through the Red Sea, it'd almost be like an aquarium, wouldn't it? You might be able to look in there and see all the fish swimming around. Maybe those fish are looking at you going like, oh, what's going on here, guys? I haven't seen this before. There's humans down here. An amazing miracle. And then God drowns the other army. But what did the Israelites do after that? A few days later, 
We need water. I'd rather go back to Egypt where at least I had water. So many crazy things going on. So if we come to Hebrews chapter 3, we start in verse number 7. It says, Wherefore, it ties us into what has been said, Jesus is greater than Moses. Then there's a parenthesis in your Bible, right? It starts, the parenthesis starts there in verse number 7, goes all the way down to verse number 11. And it says, As the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with the generation, and said, They do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. The Hebrews are on the edge of a decision. This group of people, they're listening to what is being written to them by the Holy Spirit. They know what God is presenting to them. And he's saying, listen, we're presenting the gospel. Don't harden your hearts. They don't want the children of Israel or they don't want these people to do exactly what the children of Israel did. It's interesting also that it says, the Holy Ghost set, in verse number 7. In Psalm 95, David spoke, didn't he? But now it says here that the Holy Spirit says something, and he quotes David. You know what that teaches us? The Holy Spirit that is writing in Hebrews is the same Holy Spirit that gave David the words in Psalms 95. So when the Holy Spirit the Ho says, the Holy Spirit says, he is literally saying, I wrote the Old Testament, I'm writing the New Testament. What tremendous truth. Where does the word of God come from? It comes from God through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is God's words. It's not David's words. It's not Paul's words. It's not Moses' words, the Pentateuch. It's God's words. There's tremendous truth in that little teeny tiny phrase that we can take with us today. These are the words of God. 2 Peter, by the way, 121 says, For the prophecy came not in any time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Then he says, harden not your hearts. The word that, that phrase, harden not your hearts, it's used here in Hebrews chapter 3, verses uh, right here in uh, verse number um, 13. It's also used in verse number 15. And then it's used in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 7. We need to hear this today too. Harden not your hearts. Don't do what the Israelites did. You, you know what? It, it, and it's, it, it blows our mind today, right? God performed miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, the plagues came. And many of the plagues didn't even harm the Israelites. They only harmed the Egyptians. And after parting the Red Sea, and then complaining about not having water, and then they, they went to Merah where it was bitter water, and then God made it fresh water, then they still complained, didn't they? One complaint after the other. And once you start complaining, which, which by the way, if you work at, if you go to work and there's someone around you that just complains all the time, it is so annoying and so hard. And then it's easy for you to get right on the same boat, isn't it? They start complaining about something, and you're like, hey, yeah, that's right. Let's complain together. God does not like a complaining heart. That's not what we're called to do. The Israelites were a complaining group of people. And literally, they were getting to the point where they would say, I'd rather go back to Egypt and make bricks without straw than to be out here and allow God to take care of us. And by the way, even when God started providing manna, what was their attitude that, about that eventually? That's right, I want meat. So God gave them meat, didn't they? Because it came out their nose. <laughs> it's exactly what it says in the Bible. They got sick of their meat, too. Don't harden your heart. Because I'll tell you what. First time you do something, 
First time you commit a sin, you know, a certain sin, first time you do something wrong, you probably got really nervous about it, didn't you? I mean, you knew as a little kid that you weren't supposed to go into some room or you weren't supposed to grab the cookie from the countertop or you weren't supposed to do something. And you go off and do it anyways. You finally build up the nerve to do it. It's really tough the first time, isn't it? After you get away with it once, what happens the second time? A little bit easier, isn't it? Before long, you're just doing that thing. Not so difficult anymore, is it? Not so tough anymore. And then when you get caught, you're not really, you're not really sad about your sin in many cases, are you? You're just simply sad that you got caught. When you hear the gospel message the first time, there's probably this great draw in your heart to give in. Say, wow, I've never heard that before. Many people have become believers. It's the first time they ever heard the real gospel message. First time you say no, it's the hardest time to say no. From there on out, the Bible just declares it as a hardened heart or a seared heart. And you know what it's like to have a seared heart or something that's been seared? If you've ever injured yourself really bad, <sighs> lost a bunch of skin, I, I got a place on my arm where I, where I cut my arm where I was, when I was four years old. The, the, it was a glass door, it came swinging shut, and I put my arm out. And it, it cut me from here to here. And I got a big scar right here, right in the middle, where it got the deepest. My dad, my dad wrapped up my arm with duct tape. That's, that's how tough men do it back in the day, right? <laughs> Toilet paper and duct tape. I got some scars up here, too, where um, the glass went in. But guess what? Right there in that spot where that scar is, there's like no feeling. Now you could probably cut it again. I wouldn't even feel it. That's what happens when you sear something. When something hardens. Maybe you get calluses on your hand or on your feet. You can just grab that skin. You can pinch it till. All you want, right? You can put needles in it. It doesn't hurt. You can't feel it. Well, that's what happens every time you hear the gospel and say no. You are searing your conscience. It gets easier and easier and easier. Harden not your heart. Moody preached a sermon one day. He told people, go home and think about it. And tomorrow, be ready to make a decision. Cow knocked over a lantern that night, set Chicago on fire. Next day, half his congregation was dead. He said, I will never ask anybody to think about it again. You're making a decision now because tomorrow, you might not wake up, right? Bible says today is the day of salvation. So verse number eight, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. You need to do this immediately. You know what the provocation is, by the way? He uses the word provocation in the day of temptation. That's the wandering around in the wilderness. That's Exodus in chapter 17. And this is really building up, we're talking about, when they were thirsting, when they wanted something to drink, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years, for 40 work, for forty years, they ended up having to wandering around in the wilderness. They saw a lot of miracles. They were still being tested at those times. And I'll tell you, no matter how many miracles God did, they kept saying, prove it to me, prove it to me. Prove it to me. It was never enough. Don't be like them. Verse number 10. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. That word grieved means aggravated or angered. I was angered at that generation. 
and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. I keep showing them, and they keep turning away from me. Their heart never turns to me. They don't know my ways. So verse number 11, So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Rest of the promised land. God swore in his anger, you're not going in, so they didn't. Why? Because they rejected, they rejected, they rejected, they rejected, they rejected, they rejected. And then for 40 more years, they rejected. And they all died, millions of them, over the course of 40 years. So that's the illustration. Now the invitation comes in verse number 12. Take heed. See what they did. Recognize what they did. And don't do what they did. Take heed. Brethren, lest there be any, or lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You've heard the message. Don't do what Israel did. Don't depart from God. Accept. That's the invitation. That's the invitation that God gives to you today, gives to everyone. Now, if you already know the Lord as your personal Savior, you don't need the invitation anymore, do you? Once you accept the Lord as your personal Savior, you're on your way to heaven. You don't need to do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. God has paid the penalty for your price. Christ has paid the penalty for your sins. So when you accept, all of your sins are washed clean. They've been paid for. Verse now, number three, the instruction. We're going to see the instruction here now, starting in verse number 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. When do you need to make this decision? While it's called today. <laughs> do it today. Why? Because the moment you start rejecting, it gets easier and easier and easier and easier. Your heart is seared towards the Holy Spirit. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. There's that hardening of the heart. Verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You know what is indicative of the believer then? Is someone who will say, I believe, and then the proof is that you hold steadfast to the end. Now, does that mean that someone can become a believer and then they no longer live like a Christian, so they're, 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 they lost their salvation and now they're going to hell? That's not really what it's saying, right? What it's saying is you prove to yourself and you prove to the world that you are a believer when you live the believer's life throughout your whole life. That is what the believer should look like. But I will tell you that there are people who come to know the Lord as their personal Savior. They started producing the fruits of the Spirit. And then somewhere along the lines, they began to harden their heart and, and sear their heart towards the Holy Spirit. They don't lose their salvation. They're still going to heaven. But boy, is that a miserable life. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So the, some of the most miserable people on this earth are those that became believers and then live a sinful life, and God chastens them their whole life. Miserable. And they end up hating God at the end. Doesn't mean that they're not going to heaven. It just means that they are being punished by God. Verse 15. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. He repeats what he's already said. That means it's important. Do it today. Do it today. Do it today. Don't wait for tomorrow. If you wait for tomorrow, it's going to be easier to say no. Do it today. Verse 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. For some heard and did provoke. Out of the millions of Israelites, 
How many provoked? All the millions, except for Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> They're the only two. So that's why it says some and not all. Verse 17. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? God grieved for them for forty years as they rejected and as they sinned. And now lastly, we get the, uh, the, the, uh, the unbelief is what we have here. So we had the illustration, we had the invitation, we had the instruction. Now, why did all this happen? It's because of unbelief in verse 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. Those that didn't believe could not enter into the promised land. Those that don't believe today will not enter into well not enter into eternal uh, salvation with Christ. In verse nineteen, so we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Reemphasize what keeps people out of heaven: unbelief. I'll tell you, murdering all the Jews like Hitler did will not keep you out of heaven. That's not the prerequisite for going to heaven, right? What will keep you out of heaven is unbelief. Your salvation is by grace and grace alone. It's not of your works, because if you could work your way to heaven, you would boast about it. And you would get the glory, not God. God receives all the glory. So don't turn away from God. And the more you turn away from him, the easier it'll be. Today is the day of salvation. Don't be like the Israelites. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for this lesson that you gave to us. Uh, what a tremendous lesson. I know we covered a lot of verses there. But really, it was all a warning. Our illustration is the Jews, the Israelites. Don't turn away like they did. When you hear the message, when you hear about Christ, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. Don't go home and think about it. Don't think, well, when I do some of these different things in my life, then I'll become a believer. Today is the day. We're not guaranteed of tomorrow. I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody hearing this uh, out on the Internet or wherever, that they put their faith and trust in you. What does that look like? Believing what Christ did, that he came to this earth, died a perfect lived a perfect, sinless life, and paid the price for my sins, for everybody's sins. What does it look like? Recognizing that I am a sinner, that there's nothing I can do to earn my way to heaven. Recognizing that by confessing with my mouth the Lord Jesus, that he died and raised again, I put my faith and trust in that. And then praying to God, asking Christ to come into my life so that I can know eternal salvation. That's what belief looks like. It's all what Christ did and nothing of what I did. I pray, Lord, that as um, we consider those things, and if there's anybody that needs further explanations, I would love to have conversations with anybody. Father, I pray these things in your name. Amen. Mm. All right, we do have a closing song. Let me find my thing here. That'll be number 293. Amazing Grace.